we, uh, this, is, this is a hard passage. I was talking with my connection group last week, and, and the, uh, this is, so if you have it in your, if you looked at the bulletin, it's Romans uh, chapter 3, you know, 1 through 20. So it's a nice long passage, and it's a part of something else that's even longer that you get into. But as I go through this, um, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, I know how I got here. So what happened is Dennis is looking at this, and, and Romans is hard, and he's looking at it, and he, you know, he got to this week, and he's looking ahead, and he's reading it, and he's going, this is really hard. And then he, and he reads again, and he goes, this is really hard. And, um, and then he turns to Suzanne, and he says, Suzanne, where are we supposed to go to Florida sometime soon? <laughs> and, and that's pretty much exactly how I ended up here. Um, and so... Uh, we're going to do our best, uh, but uh, you know we are we are grown adults, um, except for those of you who are not grown adults, um, and, and those who are grown and, and uh, but not adults, but who are uh, who are adults also and not grown. Um, so we have all those. But regardless of which category you fall into, we're going to make it through this. We can we can handle this. Uh, uh, there is grace to uh, overcome all the scary uh, words that uh, sometimes you read when you're reading Paul and all these things, and we can do it. Um, you know, maybe we'll see. So, all right, we're going to go jump right in to the scripture and we'll see where we go. There we go. Uh, Romans uh, chapter three, and this actually starts way back in chapter two, 17. And so I I may refer back into chapter two uh, a little bit, but uh, we'll, we'll start with chapter three. What advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Oop, yeah, I'm not paying attention. You're going to have to help me out. Yes. There we go. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being be a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's right, if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing His wrath on us? I'm using a human argument here. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God? Ju- yeah. Somebody else is going to have to read this in a minute. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some have slanderously claimed that we say, let's do evil that good may result. Those people, their condemnation is just. What shall we do? What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. Okay, now we, we do need to stop here because if you remember just like three slides ago, back to, uh, or so back in verse one, uh, it said, What advantage is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. Then you get to verse nine. Let's go back to verse nine. Um, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. So this is part of why Dennis ends up in Florida, um, <laughs> these kind of things. So uh, and uh, you know why I consider joining him, you know, part way through the week. So, but but you have the, these kind of confusing things going on. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. They have all turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. It's, a, uh, it's interesting, as Paul goes through this, 
Paul, he, he's an uh, intellectual guy, smart guy. He's, he's been studying from his early life under a guy named Gamaliel, and that doesn't mean anything to us today. We don't, we don't know who Gamaliel is. Uh, we don't know it other than I'm going to mess his name up probably half a dozen times more you know, through the service. Other than that, we don't you know, know a whole lot about him today. But among Jews in the, in the first century, and even, even among Jews now, they might actually, uh, today's Jews might actually know this name because he, he's pretty famous. You, you didn't go to a seminary uh, as a Jew in that day. You didn't go to a school or, or whatever, a university or anything like that. You would study under teachers, and they kind of had their own schools. So one of the rabbis who is uh, maybe one of the more famous, maybe the most famous, you could say, certainly uh, among some circles, is Gamaliel. And so if you, they may not know who Paul is, but if Paul comes and he says, um, I studied under Gamaliel. So that's like me saying I studied you know, at, at Yale or Harvard or I studied at Stanford. And I only know uh, a few people in person, uh, one, or one at Harvard, one at, one at uh, Stanford, that I actually know personally that studied in that kind of environment. And they are really, really smart people that I have a lot of admiration for and, and kind of wonder how, did, how do I get to hang out with such cool, smart people sometimes. But uh, they would have known Gamaliel. They would have totally known that when he comes up and he says that. So that's the kind of background and education he has. He's this really, really smart guy. And he studied with the smartest people of his day. And he's, he's into it. He knows the law. He knows the prophets. He knows all the rules and everything about uh, Judaism and, and all how it's studied. He knows all the little nuances. And, and other people have written commentaries and writings. And Paul knows all that. Uh, and, and he's got the, the best guy that he studied under. Then he goes and has this conversion experience. So he's on Damascus Road and the light shines down. And so I have to ask you, is there anybody? Because we make these assumptions, right, in the church. I just start talking about Paul. You're like, I thought we were talking about Romans. And I get that. So, uh, you know, uh, Paul is the, is the guy that wrote this book. And so we, we always assume, and I, and I don't know, I'm, I'm so churchy. You know, I grew up in the, in the church and all this other stuff, and we'll kind of get into that. But... We have to be careful as we go through that, uh, you know, I don't want to put up a barrier, like, from, from, from the get-go. So if you don't know who Paul was, it doesn't matter. You know, we're, we're going to talk about him a little bit. And I, I just, I don't want anything that I do to separate people from hearing God. You know, because I, I try hard, I, I try, but we've all got to, you know, have a little humility with this, right? Nobody's, nobody's an expert. And we try hard. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm the designated expert for the day, but you should go back and look it up when you get home, right? Um, so that's how this works. But, you know, if you've never heard of Paul, you've never heard of any of this stuff, it, it's, you're, you're in a good place because it doesn't matter. You don't need to know that ahead of time. And so you go there, and so this guy Paul, is, he was a Jew. He's, he's this very Jewish Jew, as you can be. And he knows all his history, right? Yeah, that's, that, you like that, right? <laughs> he's a Jewish Jew. Um, but it's like, it's like saying, it's like saying you know, somebody, um, when you call somebody a man's man, right? You know what that means. This is, this is, a, this is somebody, you, you, don't, you don't think of anything different. You're like, oh, there's a man. You know, that's, uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm standing there beside uh, uh, Rich and Rick this morning. I'm like, yeah, i got to step away here. That's, uh, those are men, you know, there. So I'm, I'm little Mark. So uh, I, I, know, I know where I fall in the, in the pecking order. You know, it's, it's not my term, time to eat yet, right? So I, so I, I, I waited out until it's safe. But, you know, so uh, Paul is, is, he's not, you know, he wouldn't say a man's man, but he's a, he's a Jew's Jew. He, he knows it. He's as Jewish as you get. And he's actually, you know, abusing Christians, you know, in his, his early on. So, the, you know, the early Christians, they were persecuted by Paul. He was seeking them out. He had letters. He was, he was high up kind of in this ranking uh, of Jewish social structure and everything. And he's sending out people to, uh, to arrest Christians because um, all the early Christians were Jews, and so all the early Christians, and what he's saying is, they're ruining um, our Jewish religion. So we're going to go out and we're going to arrest them, and he's having them killed. There, there are all these things going on. And so Paul is this guy. He has status. He has background. He has knowledge. He has education. All these things. He's a Jew's Jew. 
And then he's on his way to arrest some more Christians, and, and there's this light from heaven, all this stuff. And Jesus kind of speaks to him right out of this light. You know, Jesus has already gone up to, to heaven to be with God and kind of reign over uh, everything from there. But he speaks to Paul and makes an exception. And so there's this light, and it blinds him, and he has this experience, and he's blind for, you know, a few days. And somebody uh, comes in and prays for him, and, and he's able to see again. And, and God says... Now, you're a Jew's Jew who I want you to go talk to and take the gospel to as the Gentiles. And so it's in, people don't use those words, Jews and Gentiles, today. Maybe, maybe everybody knows what they mean, but uh, basically, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And so I don't even want to assume that. That's uh, one of the churches in Annapolis that I've spoken at a, a number of times. There's actually a, a Jewish lady there, and she's always very proud. So I talk to her periodically afterwards, and she comes up and she tells me about her, her, her family and her history and, and these kind of things. And, and so, you know what, if, if you're a, a Jew and you have Jewish heritage today, so this is, this is a really good place to be. You know, today, so we don't always talk about Jews and Gentiles and that kind of thing, but uh, very, very cool subject uh, that we got today. So we have uh, he's, he's going, and, and so Paul is this very Jewish Jew, and he doesn't want to eat or, or socialize with Gentiles, and anybody that want to pollutes or waters down the Jewish religion, he's going to go and arrest and have them killed. And God says, "Well, guess what? I want to show you." Uh, who I am, and so I'm going to make you go to the Gentiles, the very people that you wouldn't want to have anything to do with, the people you look down upon, all these, all these things, the people that you would reject in every way, all the time. We're going to, I'm, that's who your ministry field is. That's where you want to go, and that's who you're going to have to talk to. That's who you're going to have to take and show those people my love, the people that you hated. And so it's this uh, really interesting situation. So he's taken the gospel to the Gentiles, and he gets in, I mean, he, to the point that he takes this on, it's, it doesn't happen immediately because he kind of goes off by himself and he has to process this. He's off on his own. But when he comes back and he begins to um, connect up with the other believers, he's, he's with Peter and he has this fight with Peter because Peter was eating with the Gentiles and then some Jews came along and Peter said, well, maybe I can't eat with the Gentiles and go over and eat with the Jews. And Paul is mad at him. So Paul's going to take up for the Gentiles because he really wants to do, I mean, he was misdirected early on, but he wants to do what God wants him to do. And he's going to go to the Gentiles. And if somebody's going to say, nope, those Gentiles aren't any good. I'm not going to eat with them because I'm a Jew. Paul is mad. And he's he's going to give it to them. And he's going to say, no, God said the gospel goes to the Gentiles too. And he's going to take up for them, and he's going to do that. And when he goes into places, so he's taking this missionary journey. He's traveling on these, these crazy old boats that would have scared me to death. And he's doing all this stuff, and he's going place to place through the Roman Empire. Do you know it was easier in... In the, in the first century to travel from Israel to Rome than it is today? I mean, think of the crazy stuff that's going on. I mean, we don't think about that. We think this is, this is old and the boats are terrible and all these things, but you had the Roman Empire there and it created peace. So this is the perfect time for Jesus to come. I don't, it, it clearly wasn't an accident. Galatians says he came in the fullness of time. So he's coming in the fullness of time, Jesus, and Paul is able to go and travel the world like we can't travel today, which seems crazy because of how long ago and how far that is, and they didn't have airplanes, they didn't have uh, the safe boats that we have, they didn't have all the kind of stuff, and yet it was safer for him to travel from Jerusalem to Rome then than it is for us now. And that's a, that's a wild thing. And so he goes and he's traveling on this. And every time he goes, he comes in to a synagogue. Synagogue just means gathering. We're, matter of fact, um, the, the early churches in this church here even, all these churches are built around the premise of a synagogue. If, uh, if a Jew in the early uh, century would come in and they would look at this and they say, oh, well, this is a synagogue. You know, they, they would wonder about the cross. They would wonder about all these other things. Um, but this is a synagogue. This is a gathering of the people. And so the, the, he goes and he would find, where's the local synagogue? Where's the people of God meeting? And so he would go and he would talk to them. And those are going to be Jewish people. But he might have god fears who are Gentiles who are kind of tipping, you know, they're, they're dipping their toe in the, in the Jewish pool. And they, they, they know that God's true, but they're not sure how to work that out in their life. And so he would go, and then he begins to go from there and find the Gentiles. Where are the Gentile believers? Where are the Gentiles that believe in God? And he begins to minister to them. So he would go to the Jews and the Gentile. So all along this, this way, he's, he's holding on to his Jewish past, because that's where he goes first, almost always, is to the, the synagogue and to the Jews. But then he always turns around and he goes and looks for the Gentiles. Where are these people that... that uh, have been away from God, who now it's my job to, to make sure they know that uh, they're not supposed to be away from God, that God loves them, that God died for them, that he, that he sent his son. And so he's doing all this, 
Um, so he is, he is literally, and I have, a, I have a microphone, so I'm going to try to do this in a good way. So he has a hold of two worlds, right? He has the, he has the Jewish world in his one hand that, is, that he was born and he was raised in. And then he has, God has given him and, and he holds on and he's given him the Gentile world. And so he's holding on to both these worlds at the same time. And he's not going to let go. And he comes to this church. Um, oops, I skipped. So he's, he's holding on to both these worlds. And he writes this letter. He's, he's really geeking out. So you can tell Paul's a geek, right? He's writing all this stuff. It's confusing to us. I, I totally get geeking out. So yesterday, Abby and I were talking. See, she doesn't want to sit up front anymore. It's like, I made a mistake. I should have came in late. Should have sat in the back. So we're talking yesterday. And... Uh, and, and I'm, she's sitting over doing something on her uh, Chromebook. I don't know. She says schoolwork. It was probably games. I don't know. I didn't ask her. So, uh, right. But, uh, yeah, she, it's schoolwork. Yes, no. So, anyway, so she, she's over there working, and I'm, like, sitting and reading stuff. And, uh, um, and I'm like, Abby, so if I talk to you about uh, Google's AlphaGo project, and she, she's sitting there. She's just looking at the screen. And I'm like, Abby, Abby, uh, if I, if I told, talked to you and told you about Alpha, uh, Google's AlphaGo project, and she's sitting there, and I'm like, Abby, and she's like, I'm afraid to answer. Because <laughs> no matter what I answer, I'm afraid you're going to tell me about Google's AlphaGo project. <laughs> Which is true. <It's> what <laughs> but I didn't. I walked away. And I, uh, you know, I had mercy on her. But, but I get geeking out, right? I, I get this whole thing of, you know, I find something and it's really cool and I'm geeking out on it. And Paul is geeking out here. Because he, is, he is, has a hold of his Jewish history and his Jewish past, past, and he's got a hold of this Gentile calling that God's given him. And everywhere he goes, he's holding on to both of these things. So that these things that people thought were separated, people that there could be no convergence. The Venn diagram is one big circle over here and another big circle over here, and they don't touch. And Paul says, no. And he grabs a hold of both those circles and he pulls them together because they overlap you know, maybe the cross, right? And so he pulls these things together, and he says all these things that were separate, that were distant, that were far apart, they're not really two things after all. We always thought they were two things. We always thought they were separate. We always thought they were distant. We always thought these people could not get along, could not be together. And Paul says, I've got a hold of both of them because God told me to. And I'm not going to let go because what we thought were two things are not two things. They're one thing. What we thought was separate can be united. And he's, he's, he's there and he's going through it. In the church in Rome, it's, it's kind of different because a lot of the other places that he goes, um, the Jewish population is, is more prominent, right? So the, the, the Jews were getting persecuted in Rome, and so they, they, were, they were driven out, and they, and they were just starting to come back into Rome. So even the population in Rome itself is more Gentile than, than Jewish, you know, regardless of whether you've come to, to Jesus, become a Christian or not. So the Jews are beginning to, to trickle back into Rome, and some of them have come to Jesus. They have, they have, uh, they have recognized, so we talk, we talk about Jesus Christ. Well, Christ is just... Um, the Greek word is for Messiah. It's, it's his title. So Christ is a, is a Jewish word, really. So it's just the Greek word to say Messiah. So Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He's the Jewish Christ. And so we, he comes, and, and some of the Jews have accepted and realized he is the Messiah. This is the guy we've been waiting for our entire history since Abraham to come. This is, this is the one. And so they've accepted it, and they've become a part of this. And so when we talk about um, these people, most of, the, most of the churches they go to, Paul starts with the synagogue and then goes out to the Gentiles after that. This is almost the opposite because the Jews have been persecuted. So the majority of the Christians here in Rome are uh, Gentiles. They're not Jews. And so is, is what Paul's been doing all along is he's been telling Jews, you need to accept the Gentiles. You need to accept them. They're, they're, they're God's people. They're, uh, you know, God has claimed them as, for his own. It's, it's this amazing passages. I slept, honest Nathan, I slept. He, he, he always asks me every time, did you sleep good? And he wants to know if I'm going to cry. You know, so, <laughs> because if I, if I don't sleep, I cry more. So, um, but there's these amazing passages you get in the Old Testament. And the orphan... 
and the widow and the stranger. All these people, the, the sojourner, the, the people that the foreigner that's wandering through, all these people that don't have anybody. You read the Old Testament, God says, I claim them. They're mine. And he doesn't say whether they're Jew. As a matter of fact, the foreigners, the sojourners that come through, they're not Jews. And God says he claims them. And all these people that we, we think are the, the outside, and God, God comes, and he comes through Paul and these other things. So, so much of what he's saying is um, God has claimed them as his own. And so, so much of what Paul's doing is going to Jews and saying, God, all these sojourners that come through, they were Gentiles. And so I don't know what the logic and what the argument Paul did to convince his Jewish brothers that, that they were uh, to accept the Gentiles. But man, that would have been a good one. Because the, these people, these sojourners coming through, they're, they're, some of them are going to be Jews, but there's going to be a lot of Gentiles coming in. And God claims them every time. The widow, the orphan, the sojourner, the people that don't have people. God claims them. And he says... I will be theirs, and they will be mine, and we will make a people out of them. And he goes to them, and he grabs a hold of these Gentiles. But now Paul's got to go back to them and say to the Gentiles, don't reject the Jews, right? And so there's this weird uh, situation going on here where, where it's hard, because on, on both sides we have this, uh, this pride, you know, so, we talk, so we've been talking up to this point about Jews and Gentiles, and I want to I re- reframe the idea here for you, because I want to talk about it in terms of uh, the people of God. Because when, when Jesus came, you kind of did away with this idea of Jews and Gentiles. And, and instead, what is the more prominent is the people of God, is what comes next. And so the church becomes the people of God. You know, at when, when you get to Jesus. And it's not, it, there are Jews, and there's still Gentiles, and some of the Jews that are, that are in the church, they're going to continue to practice some of their Jewish uh, traditions. They're going to continue to practice certain Jewish fasts and certain Jewish festivals, and they're going to do that. But they're claimed Jesus, and it's okay. They're going to walk in that path. And, and so what's going to happen is that um, I'm going to lose my place. That's all right, you know, there's grace. So we... Uh, we have this uh, pride in, in, in ourself that's different. So the Jews had pride in being the people of God, but now, and, and the Gentiles were the newcomers. And so with us today, I, I want you to think about maybe, instead of Jews and Gentiles, and we're all the people of God now, I want you to think about people who've been in the church for a long, long time, right? There's a certain pride. I grew up in the church. My mom started the nursery, and I told you this. I don't know. I think I told you this. So she started the nursery with me when I was a baby. I mean, you can't get more in church all your life than that, right? So, so um, I've been in church for a long, long time, um, which, I, you know, for what it's worth, seen a lot of ugliness in the church. You know, when, when you're in church a long time, you see, you see the, everything. Um, but there's, there's all this stuff, and so there's this advantage. And so... When, uh, when last week, um, Melanie played Finlandia, you know, so uh, for the, the offertory, which is, uh, you know, Be Still My Soul. But Finlandia is this, it's, it might as well be the national anthem of Finland. So it's, uh, it's this thing, and in all kinds of church hymns, it's such a beautiful, beautiful song, and all these church hymns get set to it. And I'm sitting there, and I, I'm singing in my head, you know, multiple of these songs as she sings it. And, and, and there's this sense of pride that I, I'm connected to that. Right, that I'm 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 a, I'm in contact with that because I grew up with it and I have this thing and I've known you know I know all the Bible stories from when I was little and there's you know I don't I don't do it on purpose but there is a sense of which I'm really glad for that you know I should be you know that's a good thing I'm really glad for that but it, and there's all these things and I and I know about uh, you know I've been doing communion for a long time I've been doing all these things that are a part of the church that you know if you just came and and you just stepped into the church yesterday, it would seem really weird, a whole bunch of it. And, and some of the songs, I mean, you get the instrumental music that she sings, and man, that's beautiful. But then when, when we would put the music um, that's there and add the words to it, maybe it would be very unfamiliar. And even the language it's used, it's English, but it might be old English. It might be old words. And it would be very weird. But there's this pride in being in the church for a long time. But there's also this pride and value for, for the new, right? Because people who are new to the church, I want to tell you, you know their biggest uh, asset for people who are new to the church? They aren't churchy, right? The, um, 
you know, I am, I am uh, still recovering uh, from my dechurchification that's in progress. So, right, yeah, you hear me, you know what that is. The struggle is real. You know, you grew up in the church, you do all this. You, you can't uh, as easily talk to people who, are, who didn't grow up in the church. You know, whether they're Christians now or they, they've never been in church ever in their life. They don't, they don't know who Paul is or and they've never, you know, who's Gamaliel? What's that about? Is that a, a new breakfast cereal or, um, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, so if you're, if you're churchy, man, you can't talk to people who aren't churchy. It's hard sometimes. And that's, that's a, so if for the people that are new to Christ, new to the church and all this other stuff, there is such value because they're also not held back. As much as I, as I long to hear, um, be still my soul. Or I long to hear, um, oh, what was the one this morning on the, uh, there was Amazing Grace, but the one after it is the one too. I mean, it's the uh, Spirit of God to send upon my heart. That's the one. And so somebody, see, I'm, I'm, now, now it's my pride swelling up, right? Because I knew something you didn't know. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, Jesus. So, but, uh, but it's cool. I, and I, I do that. And it's not just that I'm proud about it. It actually, I know the words and they make me cry. You know, because it, God's speaking to me with that. And I have this connection with that. But I tell you what, you don't hear that on the radio. Right? There is nobody playing Spirit of God to send upon my heart. Wean it from sin from all its pulses, through all its pulses move. You know, stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me lovely, lovely as I ought to love. Nobody's singing that. I mean, you know, me, but... <laughs> But nobody else. There's that's it. It's population one, um, and and that's a real hindrance for people. You know, you 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 can it can be a real hindrance. And the people that are new to church, there is not this hindrance. They are new, and they're like, yeah, that's that's great. There's the worship music, and and if I can make it sound pretty close to what's on my radio, and I like it. And, and other people come in, and its words are different, and the message is different, and it has this, and it, you know, and the Spirit of God is really moving. And if you didn't hear the Spirit of God, if you didn't feel the Spirit of God in the, in the song this morning, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but, you know, they, they can come in. And so it's not a hindrance for them. They're like, yeah, as new as you can get. If you can make it sound like what's on my radio, the closer you can get to that, the better. And, and that's a good thing. And that's hard for me. Because, uh, I mean, I'm not old, I get it, but I'm still the old guy, get off my grass, right? That's, that's, that's me. You know, and I, I know, you know, I'm, I'm way too uh, early for that, but that's, you know, that's hard. And so we have this, so there's this pride in, in having grown up and been in the church, and there's this pride. So, so the Jews are these people that have, that have grown up, and they have the word of God forever, it seems like, for a long, long time. And I grew up in the church, and I knew the stories, and I knew all the stuff. And I knew all the songs, and I understood the communion, and I understood uh, nobody, you know, I, I knew about tithing from my parents from the time I was, you know, old enough to talk, and I understood, and there was all these things that I had. But you know what? It is a hindrance. And there's all these things, but, but the new, the things that are, that are new, and all the people, and, and, you know, the new songs and other stuff, and they don't know the background, and you don't know the scriptures, and that's a hindrance when you don't know. And what Paul goes on to say is when he grabs a hold of the old world and he grabs a hold of the new world, what he wants to do is to pull it together and say that it's all the same. And, it's, and what, you, what everybody else thought was two is really one. You thought it was two groups of people, and it's not. It's just humanity. You know, there's, there's not this division. And, you know, you look, and he, he hits this so hard um, versus, uh, I'm going to go back to, you know, nine through... Uh, We'll just start at verse 9. I'll I'll read it off this. Um, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Now he's talking to the Jews, but he's already talked to the Gentiles in early verses. So so he's talking here. What shall we conclude? Um, You know, the old guys, are they any better? By saying, get off my lawn? Nope, that's not good. We have already made the charge that the Jews and Gentiles are alike, are all under sin. And it's not that they're... Why are they not better? It's not that the Gentiles are that great. It's not that the new Christians are that great. It's not that the old Christians are, are, are terrible, which, which they are. Um, it's that they're all bad. So there is, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. 
There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their way. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We're all messed up. I mean, last week we talked about we don't want to be judging the people that are outside the church, right? And we don't want to cast judgment at people outside the church. And, and this week I feel like, you know, Paul comes to us and says, okay, don't judge the people outside the church, and that's good. But now we, we come to the place where we look to the right and to the left of us, you know? Um, and you can see how this would happen, right? Because when I, when I say the church in Rome, it doesn't look like this. We're actually talking about five or six house churches. Okay? You can see how divisions would start. I mean, let's think about in terms of connection groups, right? Assuming if we had connection groups meeting people's houses, these would be, these would be house churches. So I am in, um, you know, hey, Elevate, how you doing? Right? No, wait, see. Oh, man, this is terrible. All right. They did fall asleep. I get it. I understand. It was a lack of sleep last night. An hour short, everybody. Hey, Elevate, how you doing? Good. See, Elevate. Every time you're supposed to Elevate. Ready? All right. Um, so, you know, I, I am a part of the Elevate parent group. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Elevate. There we go. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so, and I will tell you, it, it could be easy to have divisions in this because I will tell you, um, the parent group for Elevate, oh my, Elevate really is. They have totally dropped off the edge. They have totally dropped off the edge of the earth. So the Elevate parent group, though, is fabulous. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Or so, we got three. We got three. There's more than three in the group. All right, so... I mean, you know, if, if you count me. So, but it's fabulous. But I could totally see how you get with this group of people and you think, this is such a fabulous group of people. And you get five or six little house churches and you think, man, the people that I meet with, and maybe they're Jews, you know, maybe because you would meet with probably people that you know and people that you, you, you are like and similar to and you have, have common stories or you geographically similar. And you say, this is such a great group of people. And at some point you think the great group of people that you're with are maybe better than the other group of people that you're not with. You know, they're another connection group. And you could see this. But you also have all these other things. We, Because uh, it's not just the, the, the old Christians and the new Christians. It's not just my great connection group um, compared to your maybe okay group, you know, that you have. I mean, I'm sure it's great, you know. Yeah, probably. The, um, I don't know. I haven't been there. I mean, I, didn't, I, I don't go to your group. So, I mean, I hope it's good. The, uh, but there's also this other stuff. I mean, we, we look at people, and it's not just, you know, we looked outside the church last week, and we said we're not supposed to judge. But, you know, we have, uh, we have CR people, right? Yeah, there we go. See? Uh, Part of, I've, I've stepped away a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wiped out schedule-wise, but I was with CR about 10 years. And, you know, uh, we, we, we have this thing where, you know, if uh, there, there's advantages to being in CR. There's, there's some pride there that could be, should be, because, you know what, there's some real honesty that, that different other parts of the church can't always handle. And... Um, that's okay. You know, nobody brings it to the same place, right? We don't, but we don't want to judge over on the CR side. You know, we're all honest um, drug addicts or whatever, porn, you know, porn addicts or whatever the situation is. Um, we don't want to judge uh, the rest of the, of the church because we're, we're more honest, but everybody's in a different spot. And the other parts of the church, you know, um, we don't struggle with, with porn or uh, drugs or uh, you know, we're not depressed all the time. You know, why is Christian depressed? Well, you know what? I was depressed a lot. I wanted to die different days. And, and he's like, you don't understand. Ah, can you be a Christian? Like, well, I don't know. I mean, it's like, uh, give some biologist, some chemist, what's going on in my mind? I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but I will tell you this. Uh, we got to look around the church and the people that are different than us because, you know, 
There's, there's open to some places, and there's closed some places. But everybody has this hurt. Everybody has this grace. And what Paul wants to do is, um, you know, it doesn't matter uh, whether we're just here new or whether we've been here forever. The need for grace is the same, right? I mean, the need, the need for grace doesn't change. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're at uh, CR and you're open and, and struggling out in the open because you have to. It's the only way to get past. You're out in the open and you're struggling, and, and you, whether it's alcohol or drugs or you've been uh, abused or you're struggling with pornography or, or depression or whatever you know, is, is on your list uh, of hurts, um, you know the need for grace is just the same, and, and you're in the you're in Sunday morning, and and maybe uh, you know whether it's pornography or just lust, you know, but but you've hidden it. Maybe your maybe your struggles and your hurts are just are just more subtle, more easily hid. Um, and and yet, uh, you know, your your need for grace is just the same. You know, the the, the attitude that's like, why did I, why did I talk to my coworker like that? And you know, even yesterday, you know, why did I talk to my kids like that? You know moments yesterday for me, you know, and, and you sit there and you, you think, and it's like, um, I need grace, right? And you go back to, uh, you go back to the verses uh, three and four, if we can skip back there of this. And there's this awesome thing. What if some did not, what if some did not have faith? Well, their lack of faith Nullify God's faithfulness. Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar. And the reality is, we struggle because you know, um, we, uh, we abandon people. We abandon promises. We walk away from truth, we lie, we steal, we cheat, we uh, are impatient and gracious and tolerant. And God is not. We are we are stingy with grace to others. We we hold back forgiveness, we hold back mercy. God does not. He comes to us. What if some lack faith? Does that nullify God's faithfulness? No. We abandon God and he doesn't abandon us. We walk away and he follows us. He is always seeking he is always gracious. He is always merciful. Even when we withhold mercy, we withhold grace, we do all these things. God doesn't. He holds on to us. And when, when we come here, I mean, I think, I think sometimes there is this uh, forgetting of just how desperate we are, right? I think sometimes... We don't know. We don't see it. We don't understand. And I, I love, uh, so D.T. Niles is a, is a guy that um, was kind of born in Sri Lanka and, and, and was educated in India. He's a minister. And they, they ask him, you know, to talk about what's Christianity. And he basically defined Christianity simply by saying it's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And I think if I can just turn and, and recognize, and, and the, the image is, is really so powerful for him and where he's at because he was in an area of the world that knew poverty. I mean, when he says that, there's, he, he could go out to the streets and see real beggars, right? And I think sometimes we, we look around and, and you know, we, have, we have clothes and we have uh, food, we have all these things, and we, we forget our ultimate desperation and dependence on God that, that we are beggars, Right? We, we don't deserve what we have. There's no, there's no earning grace. There's, there's none of this. We simply come before God and say, if you don't feed us, we won't eat. If you don't, if you don't have mercy, then, I, then, then I'm condemned. If you don't give grace, I'm without hope. 
And there is this recognition that, that when we have that in our own lives, and that's who we are, and that the people that are to the right and to the left of us, that are around us everywhere we go, that we are no better than them. And God does not withhold his mercy from us. How can we withhold it from them? Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that your kingdom would come and your will be done. On earth, this is in heaven. That your mercy and grace would fill us. And that we would not withhold it from others. And then on days when we realize that we have withheld mercy and grace, that we would just ask for forgiveness and we would would open our hearts to it. Come and feed us, Lord. Give us bread. Amen.